Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and you're listening to What a Flanker, the podcast series two. Now my guest today is a presenter for Sky Sports, mainly focusing on Formula One. She's worked in the sport for the last 10 years, starting out as a pit lane reporter for BBC Radio 5 Live in 2011 before moving to Sky at the start of the 2012 season. It's my good friend, Natalie Pinkham. Woohoo! How are you? I am fantastic. I've actually got in an Uber, left the house, I've seen other human beings. It's amazing. Including your great self. Thank you. What could be better? Well, I'm normally quite disappointing in, in reality, so it's great Never. to, to, to see, you know, for you to actually get out. Because I wanted to ask you, first of all, um, how's lockdown been? Uh, you know, two kids. Long. It's cr- been long, hasn't it? Crazy husband, who's also an absolute legend, but, you know. And Welsh, and which Welsh. doesn't help. Let's be honest. I know, we're not sure when this podcast is actually going to go out. But yeah, but he's Welsh for his whole yeah, life, yeah, I mean, so that, that that's is, always annoying. That is an exception, but also <laughs> this is even particularly annoying because when we've recorded this, England have just been pumped by Wales. Yep. And I saw, obviously, on your social media um, that you were uh, armed with what looked like one of your kid's <laughs> plastic guns. Nerf just to gun. Shoot, a Nerf yeah. gun to take him down. Was he Point unbearable? Point blank range. Oh, what do you think? I, I imagine he is full throttle 99% of the time, mm. always, mm-hmm. and an absolute hero of a bloke. But I can imagine to get one over... He would have been just screaming. I'm expecting he didn't message me actually and give yeah, me some abuse. Funny but... that. Yeah. Do well. Wait. There's still time. Oh, you reckon it will? Be? <laughs> it's but, coming. But you've been okay. Yeah. Do you know what? Um, I'm always a glass half full kind of girl, and so I want to find the positives and everything. And actually, being able to spend quality time with my two kids, um, I, I obviously travel a lot with Formula One, so to be there with them, fully present. Um, has been amazing, and we've really bonded the four of us. Our little squad, our little team, has been brilliant. It's not to say it's been easy. There's been some really hard moments as well. I lost a very good friend at the start of last year. And to go through lockdown and not be able to connect with other friends, uh, grieving uh, one of my best mates was bloody hard. Um, And wanted just to be with my family. And my dad's been um, obviously very strict about lockdown rules, but also very anxious and I didn't, I, it sort of brought out a different side of my dad that I didn't even know was there. So it's crazy how you can know someone all your life and then find out stuff about them in a crisis like this. But no, I think the positives far outweigh the negatives. And uh, if I never have to do another day of homeschooling, that's fine by me. I'm very envious of, um, of you know, a kind of busy working mothers anyway, but also just the homeschooling. It seems to be like this unsung thing that... I know mental health has been absolutely hammered and a lot of people are talking about it, but the homeschooling, I think, has pushed people almost to the edge of like the relationships, of, of everything, especially with the kids. Because, you know, they sort of, what, what I led to believe, the school sort of go, they check in at the start, they check in at the end, they just sort of go, here you go. And you're yeah. like, what the fuck am I doing? How do yeah, I, how do I, how not do I do a this? clue. Not a clue. I do have a newfound respect for single parents, for all teachers, for anyone juggling, stay at home parents. I mean, I take my hat off to you. I don't know how you do it. Um, but really, I've been quite worried about my kids, um, particularly our son, because they just need structure. They need discipline. They need structure. They need to run around. They need to be with their mates. And they've been deprived of all of that. Look, we're really lucky. We've got each other. We've got a roof over our heads. I just dread to think. I just think there's going to be a grim legacy of all of this, particularly on the younger generations. But anyway, I'm not here to bring... <laughs> A town that's yeah, I was about to say. Soz. Can we get the uh, the engineer to put uh, play some some really quiet music in the background? Um, no, but I I, I want to know about that stuff because, you know, the whole idea of kind of what the flanker podcast is to explore people that I'm that I'm interested in that I think have done some stuff that's inspirational that have that I've known that friends as well as kind of people that I don't know that well. Um, and obviously you are in a very difficult career in terms of a male dominated environment in TV anyway. But you've also gone into an even more male-dominated sport in in Formula One and choose, chosen sport in general. And what I want to explore with you today is kind of what's it like as a woman in those in in that environment. How's it been for you? Um, and obviously, I'm reminded by my wife every day that I'm a misogynist asshole with a very <laughs> limited scope. I was, you know, all all boys boarding school, yeah, no university, team sport. So I'm doing rugby, my bit, to, lad, 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 <laughs> rugby yeah. lad, and for rugby lad. Read misogynist arsehole at that time, mm. so I'm I'm trying to get to a grip with it. So what I want to know f- to start with is where did it all begin for you? Like where you know how did you start in all this? It's interesting because uh, I used to classify myself as a tomboy, and it's a term that I don't use anymore and don't want to use anymore. But I was always the kid at school that wanted to play all sports and wanted to watch all sports, and it was a great bonding thing for me and my dad that we had that in common. 
Um, and I was the only girl on the boys' sports teams. I mean, I cut my hair off to pretend to be a boy. And that's, you know, people ask me how far we've come. Well, you, girls don't have to do that anymore. You know, you, you, women's sport, although it's taken a big hit with the pandemic, but women's sport hopefully will come back to uh, its previous strength before 2020. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I literally cut all my hair, didn't have any boobs when I was obviously 12, 13 years old, and I used to sprint in the boys' team. It wasn't until we got through to the national finals and they saw me go into the girls' loo that they realised I was a girl and we were disqualified. Shut up, really? I'm serious. And I remember thinking there and then, it shouldn't have to be this way. If you've got the talent... And the application, the determination, the work ethic, you should be there regardless of gender. And obviously we have come a long way since. People ask me all the time about Formula One. And I have to say, as a sport, it is a meritocracy. It's bloody hard to get into, but once you're in, you have the opportunity to flourish. And they really have your back on that. Like You have the opportunity to learn and grow within a pretty safe environment. Are there misogynists within the sport? I don't think so. You know, most of the engineers, these sort of super geeks, if you like, that get into the sport, and, you know, these are the brightest minds in the world, they haven't got time or energy to worry about being sexist. And these are often the kind of geeks at the front of class that put their hands up and wouldn't even look a girl in the eye. They'd be a bit nervous around girls. So, um, Someone like me, you mean? Yeah, just like you. Right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, funny that. <laughs> You've been into the paddock before have, and obviously yeah. you tower over everyone because there's very few tall people, very tall people. I think Toto Wolff's the tallest. There's very few big people in Formula One because you've got to be little to get in the cars. And uh, yeah, so you did stand out like a sore thumb. But, but when you were, I mean, you read politics. Yeah. Did you want to be a TV presenter? What, what did you want to be as a little girl? Like, I was, was always it? fascinated by this medium of television. I always loved the fact you could tell stories through it. I thought and wanted to be a producer and then, uh, but my mum was like, no, you've always been this little performer, this little show pony. Even making a piece of toast, there was a dramatic performance around it. Asking your glamorous assistant to pass you the butter, you know, everything was a performance. And then I remember watching Zola Budd in the 84 Olympics and clashing with Mary Decker Slaney. Zola Budd was always my hero growing up because she used to run without shoes on. I thought that was just so cool. I never wore shoes because of her. Um and I remember watching that moment and saying to my dad, you know, what happened there? And, you know, Zola's, you know, technically and athletically brilliant. And why is... And he said, you know, sometimes this is kind of your first life lesson. That's not... It doesn't always go to plan. You've got to come back from disappointment and hardship. And I love the story of sport and and this sort of sport as a vehicle for social change. I love the, what sport can do. And so I always wanted to get into it. And I love making documentaries. So I thought I'd maybe go into sports documentaries. And then... I ended up doing the poker tour. <laughs> Amazing, right? Love and if that. you watch poker, it's normally in the middle of the night, so mm. your audience is normally pissed. So you don't, you can kind of get away with making a few mistakes live on air. So it was a good place to cut your teeth, and then that started to open up opportunities, and I started to go to more mainstream sports. And then eventually, Formula One came around. I actually took the job because I knew how much my brother would love it, and Sam's always been my hero. And he's crazy about Formula One. And I just casually threw it into conversation. Oh, I'm the, uh, the new pit lane reporter for, um, for, for Five Live. And Sam was like, say what? He was livid. But actually, he was able to kind of live vicariously and he's come to loads of races with me. And So he's know. cashed in off the back of Oh, it. yeah, of course he has. He, yeah, so he's just literally going, come on, hook me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny that the most of the uh, applications, as if you'd say, are for Monaco. No, you don't you don't say far don't... few ask me to go to spa. china or yeah. or yeah spa it always rains i mean that's the purest track if you're an out and out fan you want to go to spa but yeah monaco tends to be the one that you lot always always buzz me for <laughs> <laughs> i haven't tried to hit you up actually i've, I've done you come monaco. anyway don't you to yeah monaco. i've done i've done yeah i did um monaco with red bull a couple of times yeah that was unbelievable Do you know what? i didn't see a minute of the race funny that uh, funny that i was i was glued to um at the bar, the free bar, uh, <laughs> chewing Michael Fassbender's ear off, um, thinking oh, that we yes. were great mates. Yeah. And he was a, he's a lovely guy, like, really great. And I was like, yeah, email me, swapped email. He never emailed. <laughs> funny. Ne ne funny that. I yeah. can't believe it. I thought a drunken, you know, liaison in Monaco yeah. when we were best of friends over a few free, you know, Volker Red Bulls was going <laughs> to gonna blossom into an amazing C friendship. Cement your friendship forever. Because, you know, in my mind, I thought that if we're mates, I'd then be in movies. He'd then realise mm. that I had that that talent. I but... think you'd be good in movies, actually. Yeah, security guard is a tree. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> a tree. Do you know what I mean? Dorman number five, yeah. anonymous back. 
backdrop, <laughs> thug, or any of those things I would have done. Um, but with the sports stuff, you know, did you actually do you actually like Formula One, or did you like Formula oh, One? Oh yeah, to start I with? mean, I grew up very near Silverstone, so we used to go there quite a lot as kids. And my brother was fascinated by cars, so I kind of feigned an interest initially in order to hang out with him a bit more. And then I was like, this is actually very cool. And what I do love about the sport is there are so many layers. You know, I'm a big rugby fan, football, athletics, crazy about most sports. There's something about Formula One that... Um, and actually, you don't tend to get fans that like Formula One and all the ball sports. It's kind of one or the other. You're going to get the super geek F1 fan... And you get quite. I think you either love Formula One or you're not that interested, mm. unless you want to go to Monaco to to and Monaco, prop up yeah. the bar yeah. with free Volga exactly. rebels. But F1, there's so many layers to this sport, and what I love about it, and anyone that so- tries to say to me that it's not relevant to real life, I, you know, want to shake because actually um, there's so much technology that's trialled in Formula One that does then apply to the wider world and is saving lives. You know, I went up to Birmingham Children's Hospital and they were using some telemetry from a Formula One car in order to predict heart problems in b- newborn babies. You know, this is just one of the applications of the, the technology that's being um, pioneered in the sport. So I love its relevance to that extent. And I love the the competition and I love the teamwork. Again, lots of people say, oh, it's it's just individuals with big egos and it's the ultimate team sport. You know, you've got six hundred to a thousand people in the team, and and if you and then if you narrow it down to the pit crew, any one of them making the tiniest mistake scuppers the whole race. So they all have to pull together, and it's like conducting an orchestra. You have to get it right. It has to be perfect. And actually, medicine has learned a lot from that. I interviewed a great guy on my podcast called Martin Elliott, who was a surgeon at Great Ormond Street. And he had watched Ferrari's pit stops and he had learnt that this incredible precision and teamwork would work wonders in hospitals. And he was realising that a lot of babies were dying when they were being transferred from the operating theatre back to the ward or vice versa. And this was a this was a problem. And that he also said to me that what he found fascinating was that the race would always start at two o'clock, for example, Come what may, you had to be ready for the race at two o'clock. And if you weren't, well, then you didn't take part. He said what was happening with operations is they, it would start when everyone was ready. And so there was this sort of fairly scattergun approach and then they'd start at 20 past two. Well, that wasn't good enough. Anyway, he saw the mortality rate drop when he applied that level of strictness and precision and teamwork. It worked wonders. So I love that. I love the fact that it's making a difference. Because I went to the McLaren factory um, with the England team. Again, we were talking about the performance stuff and the elements of the the teamwork, the pressure, everyone doing their job. Mm. And like you said, if one element is gone, then that that falls apart. And in team sport, everybody wants to be front and centre. Everyone wants to be the driver. But forgetting that he couldn't do what he did if the other moving parts aren't there. Yeah, and absolutely. that sort of taught us a lesson. We had a go at the um, the tyre change. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we might have won it. Or, 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 or I may have fumbled at the end. I can't remember. It sounds, <laughs> I either balled it up or not. I can't remember. I think we had, maybe had another go. But it was me, Mark Coeto, and I think Chris Ashton and Dylan Hartley were in a team. And there was a lot of shit chat, a lot of <laughs> abuse going around. So I don't think we would have got the full the full job. I don't think that anyone was really concerned about it. But it I feel good. like you might be a bit big to be on the pit crew like it'll be all thumbs yeah. trying to get that tyre yeah. back on you like, yeah. oh. if you try to see if you catch a rugby ball I was all thumbs so I don't imagine trying to put a tyre on um, what I want to go back a little bit is, is, is the early days in TV so can you remember what your kind of first before the, the, the pit lane stuff what was your first job like what was it like you know what were you what were you doing and how were you accepted in there were you you know well I well I, I remember um, someone saying to me look just take whatever work you can get so I was a politics graduate but I was back making cups of tea that was first job and I was just crap at making tea, which actually wasn't a bad thing because I think they promoted me in order to stop me making shite tea. <laughs> where where like... were you doing the so tea? This was at, so this was at Endemol. Right, OK. And I was, so I was a runner at Endemol, I was a runner at the BBC and I was a runner at Sky Sports. And then I, so I got um, promoted from runner to assistant producer or researcher, researcher. And my first television experience was as a giant sausage on Ready, Steady, Cook. And it was National Sausage Appreciation Week. Amazing. And I'm a vegetarian, so the irony wasn't lost on that. And I remember going on set 
and really milking it because I was like, this is my moment. Uh, do, could they see your face or were you behind the You thing? could see, I think, I think you could just see about that much, oh, like fine. nose so, and eyes. So you felt like you weren't actually uncovered, so you really hammed it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, Ainsley Harriet was like, all right, Mr. Sausage. Okay, Mr. Sausage, you're done now. Off you get. Come on, Mr. Sausage. And I was like that. Da, 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 <laughs> yes, hands. Really milking it. And then, you know, caught the bug. That was it. And I actually went back as a kind of celebrity guest on Ready, Steady, Cook with Ainsley. Amazing. With my mum. And did, he was like... Did you say that you were a sausage? Oh, yeah, no, no. They knew. They, oh, they said, knew. They, of course. They, they brought me back on and said, this, Natalie was our runner, researcher Amazing. on this show. And now we're bringing her back. She's working in Formula One and blah, blah, blah. Girl done. I went back girl on done it. good. It Look was at that. so much fun. Did you, um, I mean, it's interesting enough that you actually put the graft in. You know, you're not one of these people that, that kind of got one gig and that made you. You you were a runner, so you, you feel like you've properly earned your spurs in that, in well, that area. I mean, the, the, it's the old adage, there's no such thing as overnight success. You've no. got to put the work in, haven't you? And everybody always said to me, and whenever graduates or school leavers message me and say, look, what should I do? You've got to be the first there. You've got to be the last to leave. You've just got to show great intent. And uh, my dad always says there's no substitute for hard work. You've just got to keep working, keep working. Eventually someone will give it and go. Did you uh, meet any celebrities that tre tre treated you in an odd way as a runner? Because uh, Chloe was a runner for a while when she yeah. thought she maybe wanted to follow her parents. And one celebrity I won't name had chewing gum in his mouth. And, he, and Chloe said, oh, listen, you've got chewing on your mouth. Yeah. He, went, he went, put your hand out and you spat it into Stop a hand. Stop it. Yeah, and, and also... He's a he's a mega mega celebrity that everyone knows, but I don't. The reason I don't want to mention him is right. I can't be bothered to get in like a war with him. Yeah, because um, he's that kind of spiky personality. Ooh, but um, I'm so I'll intrigued. Tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you off air. But um, did anyone ever do that, anything like that to you? I'm trying to think. Um, my experience was pretty good, and actually, I I remember always thinking you've got to be good to the runners because they will be your exec producer one day. And it's true because if you're worth your salt and you work hard, you will work your way up the ladder. I don't know how different it is now. Um, some people do sort of very uh, targeted degrees, don't they, of broadcast journalism or whatever because they know what they want to do. I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. so, And I was interested in politics, so I did a much wider degree. <laughs> Never used my politics degree. Well, other than to talk. Bit of hot air with yeah. you, and all, but also it's not, politics, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Or, well, no, to keep to keep the peace, to, to keep to, the to peace, be, negotiate, and yes. to put across good ideas, to be yeah, you know, I think so. To understand different people's perspectives without causing a war. That's yeah, supposed to be democracy, isn't it? We both vote. We both someone wins, and then we agree to get on. But not all. It doesn't always work like Done. that. Unfortunately. Done. Done. But you, do you feel Haskell that, for PM? Oh, I'd love that. I actually, I'm doing these mindset videos on on my Instagram at the moment, just about excuse culture and people keep saying Hask for PM and I was like I've seen that I've had enough scandals so I qualify as a politician because <laughs> if you're going to be a conservative politician yeah. which I assume I would be is I don't really fit into the Labour camp and I'm sort of you know middle class yeah, white guy that's sort of probably perfect for that um, I've already Let's got scandals break the mould I might break the mould I've got scandals in that part but I don't yeah. have the acumen intelligence and um, ability to kind of execute that. I'm not sure that would stop you. Well, yes, but it's there's cash involved over there. <laughs> if you pay. But when, when you were coming through did you see... Um, because obviously what's happened now in quite a lot of, uh, of TV and radio, there was obviously this big issue with the pay gap and mm. um, the fact that most senior jobs were taken by by men. When you were coming through as this runner, did you see a natural path of succession? Did, or did you see that it was like quite closed off? Like, you know, if you'd said to me, if I said to you back then as a runner, mm. you'll be doing something in Formula One. No, I would never. Possible? No, I would never have believed that. I never, I, I, I genuinely wouldn't have done. I knew that I wanted to uh, work in sports television. I wasn't entirely sure what path that that I would take. And um, look, I, I love my job. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, I kind of get a hit off my job. Like there's a buzz about Formula One. It's it's brilliant. I love traveling the world. I love meeting people. Um, will I do it forever? No, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll uh, cast me in for a, a new younger model at some fade, point. Fade you out. Just like <laughs> a, every season there's a new car. Sorry. Yeah, new yeah. livery. Well, there's a new pit lane report. No. I mean... Um, I've I've enjoyed a, a great relationship with Sky. They're massively supportive. I think they were brilliant when I wanted to have children because that was a genuine concern for me. I always say, you know, how how do you really support women in the workplace? You've got to support them through maternity and 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 having kids because you know, funnily enough, that's how the world turns around. We've got to procreate. Um, and I was genuinely concerned about telling Sky that I was pregnant. And I remember going in and telling my boss, and that initial reaction was. It wasn't 
faked. It was he wasn't acting. He was genuinely pleased. I'm sure it was a pain for them to have to, you know, juggle things and replace me. But they were so supportive, and I and 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 all that that black cloud just shifted, and I could just enjoy the pregnancy and look forward to being a mum because I knew I had the support of my of my employer i was going to ask you that because what it's not not only i mean i keep going back to it but not only were you, you a woman who who's got into tv a difficult male dominated thing you've gone into f1 which is very male dominated and then you've decided to have kids and be an actual mum and then go an back, actual mum an actual mum and that that i was going to ask you really whether that was a struggle or how accepting you were because i talk to people all the time yeah and and people will just stick you to less of, less of the law with the um the maternity leave, and mm. that's it. And if you if you if you fucking play around with it, they're mm. going to be on you, and they're just mm. looking to phase you out. And they sort of roll their eyes as if to say, like you said, the procreation keeps the world going round. But men can be quite difficult, and not very understanding. Mm. Well, I definitely put a pressure on myself. It wasn't something that Sky did. I definitely put a pressure on myself to come back. I definitely came back too early. I was really quite poorly after both uh, births, and I remember doing a shoot with Daniel Ricardo about three weeks after giving birth, and at the end of the shoot, and he's a close friend of ours and he just said Pink you don't look well I know you feel like you should be here but you don't have to be and it kind of took him to say that to me and I went back and because I'd been pushing for it it wasn't pressure from Sky at all and um, and I really wasn't well and I actually got <laughs> readmitted to hospital after doing the shoot and they were saying look you you just I had all sorts of uh, postpartum preeclampsia do you know what that means Post birth period preeclampsia, isn't it? But, but yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. I don't Very high pre- blood pressure. Yes, yes, basically. Yeah, it's yeah. quite dangerous. It's yeah. hypertension. But you could, if you have preeclampsia straight after, you can die, can't you? If you get that, it is very it used serious. To kill people back in the day. Yeah, didn't absolutely. I think, absolutely. I, I think someone from Downton Abbey had preeclampsia, or, yeah. or from a Poirot thing I watched. That's how I know. I didn't know what postpartum was the other day. Yeah. Someone Chloe was talking to that was about some people. And I chimed in like she was. What's what's postpartum? And I went after a party, and she was like, "No, you did kid. It's <laughs> post birth." And I was like, "Okay." <laughs> He gave learned something. Every day's a learning day. Exactly, um, but yeah. So I think the problem with a lot of women in television is, you know, that um, it is quite a fickle industry that you do put pressure on yourselves. And there's a, I mean, one former producer did say to me, uh, and I'm not going to name and shame, but if childcare is ever an issue, please remember that there's a queue of girls that want your job. That's pretty bad, isn't I, it? Oh my god! But this that's is what, pretty bad. I, like, I don't look. Of the whole idea of kind of what flanger podcast is not to like cause shit. But I, I, and you've been really obviously positive, and, you, and you, I know you can't speak highly enough of Sky. But saying stuff like that is like it's ruthless. Yeah, but thankfully he's not Sky, so no. it's fine. But 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 genuinely, um, I've I have felt incredibly supported. It's this there, there are the odd kind of. Um, dinosaurs in the industry that don't understand what it takes and listen I think I spend my life juggling and feeling guilty feeling guilty that I'm not doing a good enough job in Formula One I'm feeling guilty that I'm not a good enough mother that I'm not present enough and the kids will go where are you going where are you going and I was like well I've got to go to work no, but just don't, just don't go today. But then you know and I remember having this massive heart to heart with one of the old team owners in F1 and it was at Monaco and I'd brought Wilf and he was only about six months old and I'd brought him to the race and um, we were having a beer on this on this guy's like hospitality unit after the race and he goes, what's the matter? And I said, well, all week I've had to be at work but now I'm having a beer and I'm choosing to be away from my child and I feel awful. And he goes, don't worry, I'm going to get you back to them. And then we had this like big heart to heart on the phone and he just said to me, look, I have to say it's really important for your children to have strong role models. It's really important for them to emulate um, and and un- emulate your, their parents and and understand and appreciate hard work ethic. So it's no bad thing to be a working mum. And you know, when I grew up, I my mum's a lawyer, and she's seventy now. Oh my god, she's going to kill me for outing <laughs> I her. her in. Ah! I don't know how old my mum is. That is a weird thing. She, wow. I genuinely don't know how old she my mum is but she still looks the same as when I was born so it's unbelievable that is I unbelievable. think she's made a pact with the devil <laughs> I think somewhere there's a whole load of virgins missing a head when she's drunk all their blood but I don't know how old she is and Chloe goes how old's your mum you must know how old your mum is I was like I've never asked That's she, she just doesn't I don't know I don't know but I think women should own their age and actually be incredibly male, proud of it yeah making you feel bad but the, we need to smash that down but my mum is working harder and is a better barrister than she's ever been have I ever felt a lack of love no I'm so proud of her and I've full of respect and I love her and I've never felt that she's 
that I've missed out on anything as in a mother daughter relationship. So um, I really want to do the same for Wilf and Willow, my my two kids. Um, is it easy? No, obviously not. But I, a couple of girls have come up to me in F1 and said, oh, please just keep doing it because we want to do it. And, you know, we need relatable role models. We need working mums to say, actually, you know, it's not easy, but it's doable. And people will say, can you have it all? Can you have it all as a woman? And I and I always I always say, well, how do you define all? You know, I'm happily married, two gorgeous kids working in a sport I love. So yes, if that's it all, then brilliant. But is it easy? Of course it's not. And do I cry myself to sleep some nights? Yes, of course I do. Am I knackered? Yes. Have I aged 25 years in the last two? God damn it, yes. <laughs> but how much How much of it is the pressure you put on yourself, uh, something from your environment versus stuff that's in your head? Like, for example, there is, you know, sexism is alive and real. I, I've learned this. I learned this. I, I saw it in examples with... Um, rugby fans and when I met my, my wife Chloe I go out to people men would not talk to her and the only mm. reason they'd look at her was to see if she was fit mm. and, and if and um, Chloe I'd introduce people to her she would say something and, and it was just if she hadn't said it and I would go no no Chloe just said that yeah. I thought, and, I, and I saw it firsthand, and I was completely oblivious to it before especially because I've always objectified women because of that male dominated environment but I wonder the stuff you're going through so the perfectionism to your job mm. I, we all have that, I think, if you care and you're good. But the other stuff about the guilt, uh, and else, where do you think that comes from? Is that just natural or is that because you're made to feel like you can't have it all? Uh, do you know, I, I don't know where the pressure comes from. I, I've always I've always been competitive with myself as opposed to competitive with others. That, that's just always, I know that's part of my psyche. Listen, I don't know is the honest answer. I think there's everyday casual sexism that people, and subconscious um, sexism that people do have no idea they're even doing you know I, I I I've been in meetings before where <laughs> where myself and my female colleague have made a point and then the conversation's carried on and then one of the blokes has made the point they go that's a bloody good point that and I'm like, hang on a minute I said that like five minutes ago do you call them on it though or do you oh yeah yeah you try but you, it's about picking your battles it is about picking your battles because if you go in all and and this is something Wiggy, my husband, always says to me, chill out a bit, just chill out, just go with it. Sometimes you just have to, and I and I take his point, but equally you have got to stand up for yourself. And I look at Willow, my four year old daughter, and I want her to grow up, recognizing she has exactly the same opportunities as her older brother, and we are getting there. There's no doubt, and 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 a big part of that is parity in my my marriage that Owen, Wiggy, sorry, I call him a different name every time, twat sometimes, but, <laughs> but it, it, we have absolute parity in our relationship. So he absolutely values my job as much as his own. So, you know, we've got an example where Bahrain Grand Prix is coming up. That means he's got to juggle and he's got to move a load of his stuff in order to look after the children. He'll do that in a heartbeat because he respects what I do. And I think that that that's great grounding and I know you're exactly the same with Chloe you respect each other and support each other massively in what each other does so I think that's a, a great foundation uh, and a platform to go from are you ever going to iron out all sexism in society I mean this is something that I'm really interested in and this is I know a point that Chloe made because I, I obviously listen to all your podcasts I love them very much Thank I think you. you're great communicators both of you but um she was talking about how her uh Instagram is full of like bikini type shots and whatever else. And Wiggy said to me, I think you're a bit conservative on your Instagram. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, can't you be a bit sexier? And I was like, this is my husband telling me to be. He goes, yeah, but, you know, it's a bit boring. And, you know, you've got a good bod. Why don't you get it out there? I was like, I can't believe he's giving me this advice. And then I would put up a picture in a in a bikini. But I would I wouldn't just do it gratuitous. Yeah, yeah. I w it would it would have context. It would be for a reason. I'd be going somewhere or talking about something, whatever. And then all these comments would come below it, and I would be so embarrassed and cringe. I'd delete the picture. That's what I did last yeah. week. I just deleted the picture. And and I had this conversation with some of my girlfriends. It's like, can you celebrate the female form and want to sort of project that and talk about it and actually, you know. Or are you objectifying yourself and are you actually blurring the lines about what's appropriate and what's not? Because loads of people came to me after the, and I think this is a really good case in point, is the grid girls in Formula One. So Liberty Media came into the sport and um, to my mind made a great decision and got rid of the grid girls. Now, I am a massive feminist 
and I am a massive supporter of other women. I want to see more women in Formula One, not less. So people started saying to me, oh, are you jealous? Do you want, you, you want less women in the sport? I said, no, 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 no. My point is I want women watching Formula One, girls, young girls watching this sport, to feel that, that they have a potential future career in the sport. If they are only seeing women, and the only women they were seeing really, apart from maybe my hand coming into shot on some interviews, were women standing motionless in front of a car and being judged solely on their looks then that's not opening up the sport to all the different talents that women have, whether you want to be a team principal or you want to work in PR or you want to be a driver. And so we had to break down that boundary and we had to say, we have to make this a family sport. We have to make, we have to open up this conversation and it can't just be about objectifying women and, and judging them purely on, on, you know, whether they're fit and they look great in front of a car. But I came in for quite a lot of criticism for that. And they said, but you post pictures, you know, with a low cut top or bikini and you know and I did have this sort of um argument with myself to an extent so I don't want to take myself too seriously but I want to be taken seriously yes. so it's about having a bit of fun and exploring the I boundaries think I think, what do you think I think firstly it's it's so intriguing um because <clears throat> I think feminism for me is not making other women feel bad about them being women and exploring themselves, and that's mm. where that's where certain feminists go wrong. Certain feminists, I I feel, and in, in anything, men go wrong in, in whatever they're doing. But the dogma to say this is how women should be, this is what we're trying to do. Yes, I think for a long period of time, uh, and still now, you fight a lot of injustices, there's a lot of imbalance and stuff. So there's a lot of people with different perspectives. Uh, you know, Chloe, I regard as a feminist. Does she does she put herself up there in, in and uh, is she sexualized? Yes. Does that diminish her ability, her intelligence? Absolutely mm. not. I think uh, Wiki asking to do that. I think that's fantastic. That that he, that basically he fancies you enough to know and f uh, finds you sexy enough that he wants other people to know it. And I think that's great. I think that's great. And, and well, there's a level of confidence with him as well that is. he's not threatened by that. And or, it's an affirmation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it's a compliment. It's also affirmation. You know, there's, you know, men, uh, if you look at social media as a whole, uh, um, it's basically about, for some people, it's putting stuff up to get responses back. We're all human. We love interaction. So, mm. You presenting and, and presenting a show, you know, if you go well or people say that's a really interesting question or whatever, you feel some affirmation. If you post a picture up and you get the compliments, it's something going back. Where people go wrong is it, it, it perpetuates a real deep narcissism because you mm. then have to have it. I think in relation to I think in relation to women, it's 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 a real minefield because you're trying to be taken seriously, mm. but you also know that, you know, men and women are meant to procreate and there is mm. there's a lot of sexual attachment to women the way women dress the way it, it it's it's very uneven and very unbalanced but i don't think you should ever feel guilty about mm. it i think you should be however you want to be and if other women make you feel bad about it they are bad feminists no, or they, or they do you are. know what and it's not other women actually but the bit that was making me cringe about and why i deleted that picture in the bikini was because blokes were putting inappropriate but men are sim like, this is the one thing if men are simple as fuck right <laughs> and that is the that is the problem because everything and you know, I know I'm not a scientist um, or, or you know, kind of qualified in this, but just my kind of assumption to it is, is that you know we're meant to, we're meant to procreate. Everything about our bodies, our high a high level of testosterone, our thing is to find a mate, is to procreate. Is mm. everything's telling us to go and do it. We end up, you know, we some people just can't control themselves or don't know what's what's correct or not. And social media, unfortunately, whereas the old days builders would ogle you going past and yeah, wolf whistle yeah now people are doing that on per, uh, in person and they're not even thinking because so many times i look at stuff like people send chloe dick pics or what? stuff like all the time all the time people no. say, all the time do you not get it on the social media well i never check my dms oh right right well, go to your dms I'm i don't think i want to, to yeah, now yeah well just a bit <laughs> laugh i get close i'm like come on chloe why do you want to see it because i, I want to know are you serious oh all the time i've i've had two fannies in the whole time <laughs> which is really shit <laughs> <laughs> really shit. I'm like, listen, why? Who? Why? Because what it is, and let me explain what the men. Can't does. believe you just used the word fanny. fanny. It's such a good thing, isn't it? Oh. It's such a good expression. I want to bring some old things back, like old right. school terminology. Like knockers. Fanny. Knockers. Knockers, fannies, knockers is a good one. Um, the great ones. Um, wangers. That's a great <laughs> wangers, one. That's right. God. And so, um, I said to Chloe, and I said, you have to understand that. The, and I saw it firsthand. So I joined OnlyFans with Chloe. We did something with OnlyFans. Obviously, do you know what OnlyFans is? You know, it's so. OnlyFans is essentially uh, was originally set up to it to link. Um, celebrities with their with their fans, and you basically pay for interactions. Yes, it's been hijacked. I do know about this. It's yeah, been yeah. Hijacked by 
uh, basically somebody sending pictures of their bodies naked, whatever. Some of them go super extreme, some of them don't. There's a guy that we interviewed for the Couples Quarantine podcast who's making a hundred thousand dollars a month sticking things up his ass and, and pissing on camera for and making a hundred thousand dollars a month doing that. A gay guy, that's what he did. People followed him. It is a huge thing. So that I think um just right only fa- only fans, fans yeah, genuinely. My- <laughs> yeah, no, the reason the reason the thing is you don't have to do that. So mm. Chloe and I got signed up to Health and Fitness, two separate accounts. I put on my thing, uh, on my OnlyFans thing, um, you know, do you want nutrition, health, workouts? And I, and I could jokingly put tops off. Let me ask. 700 votes for tops off, one for training video, two for DJ. So what I do is I put the training stuff on, but then I take photos of myself in the gym and they pay for it. They pay for it. Wow. And, and <laughs> you know what? You, I'll tell you off air, but it, 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 isn't, it isn't a bad, you know, a bad uh, thing. And, you know, I said to Chloe, and I saw this firsthand because it's only fans, that what a lad's doing, right? A lad's sitting at home. And when he, a man bloke gets horny, he can't think straight, right? So what yeah. he's done is he's got so fired up, he's trawling through the internet, he's found Chloe's profile, and he's, and he's like, do you know what? I reckon she, I want to fuck her. So what it is, he then sends a picture of his dick to her going, what? I'm like, you know, like thinking in a stupid, naive male mind that she's going to go, oh, wow. I really want that. Can I come around and see you? <laughs> then what is going to happen? He's going to have knocked one out and then reality is going to hit him and he's going to be like, this is the worst thing ever. Yeah. And I saw it on my OnlyFans account. I hadn't even joined. I just set up a profile. Some bloke wrote to me, I'd love to fuck you, right? Three hours later, sorry, I'll try and control myself. Next day, I'd, I'll even let you fuck your girlfriend for me. <laughs> and then two hours later, I'm so sorry. And I was watching this guy go through the emotional roller coaster of not being able to think straight and everything else. And that's what men do. And when you look at the profiles of people that they say those comments to, I've seen, I've clicked on some of the ones with Chloe. They've got wives. They've got kids. Uh, yeah. They've got daughters. Yeah. And some of them like, um, some of the people on social media like shame, body shame Chloe. And I'm like, you've got two daughters. Yeah. Like, what were you thinking? Oh, do, you, no. do you imagine you put your daughter through what you're putting my wife through? Um, and so the social media thing is not a great avenue because you're always going to get the weirdos mm. but actually i i think again that is a sign of like if you want to put a picture up and you're building because i think you know image wise why can you not be sexy intelligent attractive a mother have everything why should you be made to feel shy away because there's a load of perverts and do you know what it is i always see things like social media as 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 a tool i post what I was always going to post, whether people like it or don't like it, and I go away from it. And mm. that's how I treat it. Because mm. otherwise, you're inviting a load of people into your life that you wouldn't piss on if they're on fire. Mm. That's the one That's the one thing I think about it. So, Well, I did actually get some really good advice. And I'd actually love at another point in time to do a podcast with you guys about social media, entirely about yeah, social fine. media, because I think it's really interesting. But I, I, I got some help after Caroline Flack died from an amazing woman called Julia Samuel, who's a bereavement counsellor. And she said one of the crucial things that I think people need to learn in this day and age is that, yes, have a social media account, but keep some of yourself back. Protect yourself. Only put an element of your life out there. Because once it's out there, it can be devoured. And you have to accept that, you know, you're putting it into the public domain. If you keep something back keep something sacred yeah. and safe, you will keep yourself sane. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, and it's it was great to, advice. It's got to be straight business. It, even however it looks contrived, in mm. a straight business. So mm. you, if you want to expose put your family, it's, it, you, you're in a controlled way. Mm. If you, if you absentmindedly share, you give too much of your soul to other people. And then, then you fall down the trap of basing your whole life on other people. So if you want to liberate your, your social media and, and, and show that you have these things, I think it's absolutely fine. I think if people objectify you, it doesn't make you any less of a a, a, a woman in my mind. So I will leave the bikini shot up in future is what you're saying. Well, I couldn't possibly comment. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I can't be seen to be trolling through okay. any other woman's phone. I've, Chloe's got a high powered rifle on me 99% of the time. <laughs> so if any other comes up like this, uh, we'll just crack on. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think as well that the thing with what you said about women in, in I think... Yeah. It's so hard because then you, then sort of you know, in, in fighting you get ring girls and the UFC and everything else mm. like that, and there'll be there'll be lots of feminists that say, well, you're you know you're belittling us, but then but then. Well, you... I think my point about the grid girls wasn't to do away with them altogether. I wanted to involve them more in the sport because I've met loads of them that were fantastic girls, yeah. really articulate, engaging, interesting women, who actually looked great as well. But some of them, we would go to a country and they would be shipped in by the you know the local promoter stand there for an hour and leave again they d- had no interest in the sport and they were there and you know it was a couple of hundred quid it was you know they were models that lived in the local area but what i wanted to do was to actually say well why didn't you do 
a garage tour? Why don't you learn about the team that you're standing in front of? Why don't you learn about the driver? Why don't you entertain the guests and take them round and, you know, and just give them a, a depth of purpose. And, you know, maybe we'll do that. I mean, at the moment we've got, you know, it's all, it's all up in the air with COVID, but we've been using Grid Kids and I think that's really nice and accessible. Look, you have to have relatable role models on screen. That's the number one key. This is why we have to... Um, explore the issues we've got with diversity in Formula One. We are still 88% male and 91% white. Lewis Hamilton remains the only black driver ever. Can you imagine that in football or no, rugby? No, no, no. And it's it's not good enough. So we are doing, and there's there's some great things happening in Formula One to improve diversity, but we have to open up the discussion. We have to, I, I did this webinar the other day with a load of kids of Badu Sports and um, they were, we did like this Q&A with a girl called Steph Travers who is the fuel flow operator for Lewis Hamilton's car. She also happens to be black. She's the only female black person in the paddock. She's the only female a black female in the paddock. What? What is that about? So, but what we need to do as broadcasters, we have a responsibility to shine the light on her work and then show other young black females, look, this is a viable career option for you. You could get into Formula One and you will do really well. Look at Steph. She's been up on the podium with Lewis after his victory. I think it was hungry. And she was up there punching the air and celebrating with Mercedes. So look, it's not a sexist uh, sport it's not elitist but do we need to do better of course we do i think what's really interesting is that during that you know i said that about the the, the pay gap issue with tv and that people's salaries were printed and then a lot of jobs in tv and radio were instantly changed to women right and the old argument always comes out is is you get the people going it's not right it's not mm. right you know um you should always have the best people for the job now i agree with that but what i what chloe said to me and which was i thought was the most astounding bit of it was that Yes, you know, that is the ideal scenario. You should always, it doesn't matter, male or female, the best person to do the job. Mm. However, when something's been so unbalanced for such a long time, imagine you have a young girl who, like yourself, a young Natalie Pinkham, who wants to get into Formula One. If you have absolutely no succession, there is no one to see, mm. you're never going to get a raft of quality to go through that. If, we, if, we, if you lose a load of jobs and swap in a load of women... In 10 years' time, mm. you're going to have the cream of the crop Absolutely. because you've got people there. And I, I had no idea about that, that, that woman in, in, in the pit. Yeah. I, di I didn't know that. But be, if you can, like you said, raise the awareness, there will be so many girls who, who will think, I don't have to be a stay-at-home mum. I don't have to do these things. Actually, mm. do you know what? Everything's open to me. And I think that's, I think that's astounding. I had no idea that was the, the thing. Yeah, and actually, really, I've sort of, this is my goal for 2021 is to tell the stories of the women up and down the grid because we've got brilliant female pit crew. We've got great engineers. Um, we've got, I mean, we, until Claire Williams and Manisha Calterborn left, we had two team leaders. Um, and that's a shame that we don't at the moment. I think Claire's got loads of interesting stories about how she's been um, treated in Formula One. Uh, but brilliantly passionate and determined woman. Um, and I'm really sad to see that she's left the sport because we do need female leaders in sport. It will happen. Um, I remember Jensen Button saying to me, there is nothing physical that precludes a woman from driving an F1 car. Look, could I... <laughs> By the way, I've never told you this, so I'm digressing slightly. Right. But I have this reoccurring dream that I am called on... <laughs> That I called onto the pitch during an England rugby match and a Chelsea football match for some reason, those two. So I'm in the stands watching as a fan and they go, and uh, coming off the subs bench to replace fullback is Natalie Pinkham. I go, hang on a minute, I can't, but I'm a girl. And obviously that could never happen in real life. I don't know why that's a recurring dream. I'm sure a psychiatrist would have a lot to say about that. But, but maybe I think that's quite an interesting thing because it's probably fighting the battle you're fighting in real life. Maybe. In it, must, it must be. It must be. It must be you being called up and feeling that, you know, I, I want to do Imposter something. Imposter syndrome yeah, yeah. and maybe I'm not, I don't yeah. deserve to be there. Yeah. Do you know Chloe what? Keeps that's so interesting. England, England players, but I don't think for any other reason than just <laughs> she's enjoying herself. I'm like, she, I won't say his name. Well, actually, I think I did say Chloe woke up the other day. The day. And I was like, you're <gasps> smiling. She went, oh, I just had a great dream about Andy Farrell. Owen Farrell. And I was like, I was like, you've just stitched her up and named oh, her. We did it the other day. We set up my on my um oh. on my IGTV, <gasps> and it fucking serves her right for telling me. What do you think that was acceptable? Imagine I woke up and I was like, oh god, yeah, another great dream about your mum. <laughs> <laughs> 
think that's make, a bit weird. No, yeah. but that's what I mean. Make it really weird. Yeah. You know, like someone yeah. goes, oh, I asked who's your top five. And when I said your sister, you got really upset. Because yeah. most people go, oh, who's your favourite seven? Yeah. Margot Robbie. Yeah. No, so sorry, Chloe. But isn't, it, but isn't it funny that when you do have a naughty dream about right. someone, you can't then look at them no. because you feel like they know? I don't have them. Oh. So weird. That is weird. I, that's <laughs> a shame for you. I know. I, that's what I, I said to her. I don't, it's one of those weird things I we talked about on Covers Quarantine. I just don't seem to have it. I don't know. I'd like, I don't know what I dream about, but it's never that. But the weird thing is, I had it once about a driver who isn't in any way attractive. I swear to God, I'm not in the least bit attracted to him. And uh, that when I had to interview him, I would just went bright red. <laughs> and I was like, he's probably thinking, why is she blushing in front of me? Yeah. And he's like young enough to be my son. Yeah, you but know, does, but does, doesn't sometimes, if you, if you fancy them though in your mind, you wake up with a dream. Yeah. Doesn't that sometimes replicate into life? Like you go, you fall, you woke up going, I think I fall in love with someone. I know. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, by the way, I know, I know I'm, I'm changing points massively here, but I think one of the best things in my job is actually having a husband. Because I've always had Wiggy at my side through that, that it hasn't compromised fine, me with fine. any of the drivers or, you know, and it, I'm not saying any of them want to pull me, but no. I'm just saying you, that that it doesn't, you know, because Wiggy's been a very kind of obvious presence with me that he's come to so many of the races, I've involved him throughout my life. Because people always go to me, doesn't your husband get a bit jealous? You know, you travel the world, you have done for 10 years with all these gorgeous drivers. And I say, well, two things. One, you'd never date anyone with a smaller bum than yours. And they all do. True. They're all tiny. But secondly, um, I think if you, if you come home t- talking about some girl called Claire at work, Chloe might be like, Who's this bird Chloe keeps talking about? But if you take Chloe in and Claire and Chloe meet and they realise that, oh, well, she's very nice and that's, you know, no threat, then there's no problem, is there? No. I mean, anyway, Chloe would have had I don't me know why a, I suddenly that in. Chloe would have had me on a satellite feed anyway. She would have known. She goes, <laughs> hold on a minute. The drone. Who's, who the fuck's Claire? I'd be like, what, what do you mean, Claire? <laughs> I've seen you here. I always joked, <laughs> I joked about like, oh, Sherlock Holmes. There's like a picture of me <laughs> with red string leading off to different things like a map Stop on it. Stop it. Um, I love your wife. She's amazing. You she's about, a mega. Yeah, good. But one, one thing I was going to ask you now, yeah. and, and I mean, it's the Best possible way. So, obviously, you're a very attractive woman oh. as well. In on a, the turn now. <laughs> Come on, let's be fair. Pass near enough past yourself by date. It's right, <laughs> right. But on your, but, but again, in that environment, yeah, it's hard enough to be taken seriously as a woman. Is it not harder to be taken seriously as an attractive woman? Like getting hit, like you said with the drivers. It's quite a nice segue into that. Getting hit mm. on by driver, hit on by bosses, hit by people. It's a bit of a shame it? it hasn't happened more often, to be honest. <laughs> 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 no, do you know what it is? I think I think a lot of women who are reporters in sport you don't want to be seen as the fluff you don't want to be seen as the token bird you want to be taken seriously and I think a lot of the time what we do is we try too hard to prove ourselves and so an encyclopedic knowledge about the sport you know and actually I think and I talked to Gabby Logan about this on my podcast I said you know did, were you guilty of that and she said absolutely what I'd do is I'd go and interview a player after the match and I would load my question with stats to prove that I really knew what I was talking about and actually you're there anyway, so just ask a very calm question and open up the conversation. You're just a conduit for the fans. You just want to engage them in conversation and, and get them talking about how they're feeling in that moment in time. So don't be... And actually, you kind of put people off if you kind of take them down. Lap 57, <laughs> did you notice that, you know, the tyre deg was in you're in all sorts of trouble? You know, just ask them, how did you cope with the, the tyre management in this race? Just ask them a really simple question. Uh, that's my excuse anyway for asking simple yeah, questions. Yeah, you just don't know the stats, but <laughs> no, I like yeah. how you can apply Yeah, that. yeah, good. But no, I think um, I think whilst the sport can, uh, it's always considered very glamorous, isn't it? You know, you go to all these corners of the earth and um, there is definitely uh, a feeling that F1 is sexy. So you want to play up to that and that is engaging and interesting and fascinating and that's what makes a lot of people watch it. But equally... You want to be taken seriously and you don't want to play into that too much. I think you definitely lose respect if you start going from the professional into the personal and back again when you're on the road. So one thing I do, although some of my Sky colleagues might not agree with this, I try not to get drunk in front of people. Right, OK. And obviously it's happening I mean, I, on I'm occasion. I'm going to call bullshit on that, but I like, <laughs> I like, the, I like again, great PR move. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, I don't want to blur the lines too much. So I try not to... You know, I'm I'm there to do a job and actually, you know, whilst I will try and maybe tack on a few days either side of it to see the country we were in or take my family there or whatever else, but I try not to. I remember going to my very first Monaco and going out hard and learning the hard way. You can't do that because I was turning up to Five Live with a very croaky voice the next day and it was like they saw straight through it. 
but you can't you, you you can't burn it at both ends. But I I think you lose people's respect if you do. You, you know they need to see you in a certain way. And equally, if you do, what's the equivalent of poking the payroll? Can you have that? Do you know what I'm trying to yes, say? Yes. Yeah. You can't do it. No. No. I, yeah. You can't do that. Don't shit Actually, where you eat. I just want to pick up on something with you. Have you noticed that when you answer some of these questions, how much you're saying, I want. I want to do this, but I, I think this, and I th- there's this, and I don't want to be perceived as that. Yeah, I think wonder how many overthinking it. No, no, not oh. even that. I just I wonder how many males have to think the same stuff. I don't know because I don't think they do. Yeah. I, I'm just not saying it's you in particular. I'm just wondering. Well, it I... is me. I think that's part of my character in fairness. But I do. I definitely worry too much what people think. One hundred percent. I think, but I think a lot of people do. I just wonder if I was a male reporter. Yeah. Do you think I would go? I want to come across as like good looking, but I don't want to be. I want to be taken seriously. Like, oh, do you think? I just don't think men. I. I just yeah. wonder. I'm just astounded, really, at the amount of thinking women have to put up with. And, and the more yeah. I talk about, it, the more I explore it. That's yeah, interesting. The more you got because you want to be taken seriously, mm. but you don't want to be taken too seriously. You want to be <laughs> yeah. sexy, but not too sexy. Yeah. You don't. You know, you want to be available because you know, but not too available. You want to be be hard but nice. Fuck me. It gives me it gives me a headache. Being yeah. like, I don't think I've ever been that considered in my life ever. That's really that's a really good point, and it probably does clog up my thoughts in my head, and I'm overthinking. But it then, and... plus you had the mum stuff onto it. Yeah. I want to be a good mum, but I want to be travelling. It's like amazing because that's what I wanted to explore with you because I just uh, it's such a fine line, especially because you're at the top of your game. And and if a little little bird tells me there might be some more progressions potentially at, at, at Sky that you can't really talk about, but some exciting stuff on the horizon, which might you know put you in a different place is. Um, that's only going to get sort of more pressure, really. Well, first of all, I don't feel like I'm on top of my game. There's Quite. definitely the, the old imposter syndrome creeps in a lot, you know. And I think that F1 is one of those sports that all the fans definitely know more than you. Right. The minute you say something wrong, they're on your case. But not in a horrible way, but just because there's a lot of knowledge out there about this sport. I feel like there's this amazing community around F1 that I... It m- might be the same in rugby, but there's this there's this kind of... A tacit understanding and agreement that you look after each other and I remember you know I've been in situations where the F1 family if you like on social media just really rally behind you and look after you and this it's amazing um but to your point yeah I mean god it is a bit of a minefield and do my male colleagues think of it I don't know I feel like I'm a constant work in progress I do put a lot of pressure on myself to constantly learn and evolve and I will always be niggled by that that was my knuckle yeah, yeah Christ you really are getting on in life <laughs> <I'm dense. laughs> your knuckles have collapsed yeah. right. but I, I definitely put more pressure on myself and will really beat myself up about the one mistake I've made as opposed to the nine things I've done well that day yeah, but I do that I do that all the so time so that's okay I, I do that all the time yeah. it's a real downfall of me and was something that haunted me through my rugby career and why I started seeing a sports psychologist at kind of 17 and still go and see someone now or, you know even things like my DJing podcasting perf- performance public speaking you know Chloe will come off and go that's brilliant but yeah. you'll be like yeah but I fucked this up and she'll be like there was no one noticed yeah. it I put a DJ mix out and someone will go Oh, you know, I, I, I messed up. Like I've got a DJ, um, mate, a guy called Alex Grover. He's also my music production partner. And I sent him my mixes. And he sent me back to go, yeah, I heard about this. Thing. Why are you fucking worried? I, I interviewed Carl Cox and he was like, stop overthinking about mistakes. Really? And, it, and, it's, and it's so true yeah. because what is a mistake? Unless it's an absolute, like, mega clanger. Yeah. But more often than not, this stuff it isn't. If someone points it out to you, yeah. who the fuck's got the time to point someone else's mistake Yeah, but out? also it makes you human. So yes. I think that's quite endearing yeah. to others. If you do make the odd mistake, you know, it's sort of... Well, it's you a way of relating. Clanger? Have you got a mega clanger you can tell me about? Like, I've done so many clangers. Like Are you joking? Well, the time I called Fernando Alonso the C word in Spanish. What? I have yeah. not heard this. Oh my god. This is so, amazing. Yeah, so You really do fancy him. <laughs> oh, no. But I um I uh was just working for Five Live and I was just trying to find a way of kind of connecting with the dry you know, particularly Fernando because I was doing this big sit down interview with him and I speak Spanish, but clearly not well enough. Because if in Spanish, um if you want to say with me, literally you'd say coño, because con is with and yo is me. But it's a nuance of the language that actually, if you say coño, it means... The C word. Yeah. So what you have to say is conmigo. So I have to say, una entrevista coño, which means, do you want an interview? Yet? <laughs> and what did he do? Was actually, what I wanted to say was, interview with me, please. He looked at me and burst out laughing because he knew what I'd, he knew he was. Tr- I was trying hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he went, I don't think you wanted to say this, no? <laughs> and I just went, what? And then he was like, and then sort of like off camera, he explained. And I was like, oh, I was absolutely mortified. But 
it was quite a good icebreaker. Yes, yes. Because then forevermore, he's like, oh, that's the girl that you know, I love drops that. the C-bomb. I love that. On the um, first meeting. What I want to know about, uh, I know we've been talking for a little while, so I won't keep you too much longer, but what I want to know about the the... The job that you do in kind of F1 is obviously you love it, like we, we, we've heard. But some of the drivers and stuff and media trained people, when you're mm. trying to get interviews, can be quite, be quite deadpan. Do you, do you find yeah. that hard? Do you think drivers are going more the other way and being less interesting? Uh, uh, you well, know? I mean, that's again why I love doing podcasts. So I try and get them on the podcast. You can definitely dive deeper into their personalities and learn what makes them tick. When they're at a track, I understand they've got certain sponsorship, you know, and uh, sponsor commitments and. Um, they're under a lot of pressure. They need to say, say and do the right thing by the team. I'm not there to catch them out. I really, really mean that. You know, I'm not looking for a quick uh, win or a headline. I'm not looking to exploit anyone. I just want to understand how they feel in that moment because that's what I feel as a fan. And I think that um, you just need to talk to them like they're a human being. Do they want a microphone shoved under the nose when they've just crashed at 200 miles an hour? Obviously not. They know that that is part of their commitment. But you've got to just try and be a bit perceptive and empathetic and read them in that moment and say, well, you know, I, I get it. I understand. Like, you know, do I really get it? No, of course I don't. I've never driven an F1 car. I think that's part of the problem. So you ha but you just have to look them in the eye and empathise with them and, and, and just try and relay that message to the people watching at home because that's that's the only reason you're there people don't care about your opinion as a reporter they care about your subject and who you're talking to and why you're talking to them and, and do, do you find that they're quite you know because you've been around for a while now spot you <laughs> all right like, you know, <laughs> done done a few laps of the circuit do they do they do they find them you know quite engaging do they go oh, yeah i mean pinks, i do you know? i feel yeah because i feel like i do know a lot of them pretty well Fine. and um you know, I, I know them from the junior formula and they, they've come up through F2 and then they've come through to reserve driver status and then they've come through onto the grid. So people like George Russell, Lando Norris, Daniel, Ricardo, th there's a lot of guys that I've known right from the beginning of their careers now. Um, but you don't, you don't want to be that old cougar that just, ro <laughs> that just rocks up and... <laughs> the old cougar. Come on then, tell us how you feel. Because, you know, sometimes people go, oh, you're a bit flirty. You're a bit flirty in that one. I was like, listen... I was not flirting, you know. Yeah. I am old enough to be. I, I like to go with aunt as opposed to mother. Right, yeah. Like some kind of cool, edgy aunt. Not like no? our birds of a feather, the weird one who lives across the way that's always going through all the men. Oh. Not that one. What's a, um, um, with the deep oh, my voice. God. Wiggy calls me that. Oh, he actually as if calls I me that. that as well. What's her name with the black hair? Yeah, I can't. Oh, oh come on. Christ. Uh, there's Linda and Pauline. No, and, and? The other one. Um, oh, God. We're having a moment. This is amazing. But, Senior you know, moment. she's like, oh, hello. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is you. That's, yeah. that, oh, my God. You're the pit lane version of oh, Birds of a Feather. Oh, please. <laughs> okay. God. What, um, what's the worst part about the, the Formula One job? Because, obviously, like you said, Sky seems to be brilliant with you. Um, is it travel? Is that the hardest thing that you have to put up with? Um, I, no, I love travelling and I don't mind, you know, and actually in 2020, I was so grateful just to travel because it was cool just to get away and do stuff. It, it was hard under COVID restrictions. We were in this bubble, but we're really lucky. We've got a great team and, um, uh, you know, they are my friends. They, they're ultimately, I've known them for years. You end up spending a lot of time together. And um, yeah, I think they've, it's a lovely team. I'm really, really, really lucky in that respect. Um, I think what are the hardest bits? Um, obviously, being away from the kids is really hard, but I do try and involve them as much as I can. And, uh, you know, they're a bit like, they're a bit take it for granted at the moment. I'm like, do you want to go to a Grand Prix? Yeah. I'm like, what? Oh, Hang on a minute. Prats, when you're 18, you're going to be like, Mum, yeah. why didn't you? And I'm like, I, I did offer. But they've come actually to most of the races now. What's your, What would you say is your career highlight so far of, of all the stuff you've done? Oh, uh, you God, that's really hard. Like interviews you're really proud of or, or moments or things where you really felt you got a grasp of the situation. And, and... Do you know, it's funny because I think it's those moments where you do connect on a human level with someone. I remember talking to Jensen Button after his dad had died and we, we were just talking as two adults about how you cope with grief. And it wasn't as if I was kind of, you know, punching the air going, oh, I've got a real scoop here. Cause that, that is not how I'm wired. Um, but it was connecting with him and then other people then wrote in and said, you know, that really resonated because it mattered to them. And I think because you get so little from a driver, they're immersed in this cockpit, they've got their helmet on, you can't really see that much emotion. You might see a little fist pumping out when, they, when they've when they won the race and they've got the chequered flag. You don't get that much from them. 
Um, so I think when you, whenever you get an interview where they just explode with emotion, then it's then it's great because you're you're doing a service for your viewers, aren't you? Is there? I mean, obviously with within the England rugby team and other things, there's always people that the media prefer to interview that don't interview. And I'm not expecting you to name any people, but there's yeah. a load of very dry people who don't see the value of the media. Are there anyone on that thing that you you hear you've got them and they're like, oh, we're gonna you know we've got so and so. You're like. Fuck, this is going to be. Like... <laughs> well, Kimmy Raikkonen is famous for giving very short answers. Right. Um, but actually, uh, he's a great family man. He's changed a lot, I think, since becoming a dad. And I actually did a, I did a shoot with him in Russia, where um, we had to race on ice together. And if if anyone listening hasn't seen it, Google this because look it up on YouTube because there's this moment where we swap over so first of all he he's driving on ice and then he offers me a go and i literally write the car off in the first turn and he's in the car and of course the pr guys come running over they go nuts he's laughing it's the first time i've heard him laugh ever because he's got this kind of like sick personality but um it was brilliant because, again, pardon the pun, it was an icebreaker with me and him because, and also I think you know he sees me as a, as a as a mum and that I'm I'm just I'm just trying to do my job. I think they all know that, Fine. that I'm just trying. I did have one moment with one um, with one of the drivers who remained nameless, but he came into the pen and he walked up to me and I wasn't expecting him at that point in time because he kind of came out of sequence. So I'm like flicking through my notes trying to remind myself what had happened in his race because I thought. I don't think a lot of people know that straight after the race, the pen gets flooded with like 20 dri- or 17 drivers. The top three are come slightly later. And they come to you and you're thinking, oh my God, you know, the camera hasn't, the director hasn't even shown me. So you have to ask a really generic question like, so how do you feel today went? <laughs> Just keep it <laughs> yeah. really loose. Um, but this one driver came up to me and... I was flicking through and I said, uh, sorry, just, and he went, shall I come back when you're ready? And I just went, Ooh. and I, and I was, I'd had quite a bad day and I was really, really missing. I hadn't had my daughter at that stage, but I was really missing my son. And when he did come, cause he just turned on his heel and walked away. And I was like, absolutely mortified. And when he did come back, I had tears in my eyes. And I said, look, just so you know, I've just two months ago given birth. I don't really want to be here talking to you. I'd really much rather be with my son. And I had to, to oh hear all of right. I said, so you doing that, I'm just a human being trying to do my job. You know, you don't have to care, but... And he just went, I'm so sorry. Oh, really? Because yeah. he's got kids as well. And right. he was like, I'm, giving, I'm slightly giving You're away right. who it is I, now. I would have gone, gone, shut up, lads. <laughs> No, yeah, I no, but he did. He was just like, and it was really interesting. Again, that was just connecting on a human level because yeah. we're just there to do a job. We're not yeah. trying to. I like how you called it though, because oh, a lot of people wouldn't have said quite that. Quite hormonal, I think. Quite... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that, but, uh, like unabridged honesty during that period, just like yeah. everything coming. You're in a in a monologue, just coming out. But fair play, he said it, and he yeah. and fair play, he reacted like. Yeah, that. he did. A lot of men brilliant. don't back down. We're not yeah. great at apologising ever. And actually, what I had to remind myself in that moment, it wasn't about me. It was about him. Yeah. He just had a crap race. He came into the pen, and there's some bimbo standing there going. I'm not ready. <laughs> and crying after. I've had kids. All right, love. Yeah, big deal, love. Not the first. <laughs> love that. Also, great things you're doing so much for women's um, kind of stuff in the workplace, but not for women drivers. Driving straight into a wall after the first turn. Well, that was something Kimmy pointed out as well. Yeah. But by the way, I'm telling you here and now, within my lifetime, there will be a female Grand Prix winner. Yeah. I'm sure there will be. I know it. There's w- some great... You, t- it definitely will not be me. <laughs> um, I mean, look, you know, I could talk to you all day, Pink, you know, oh. but you've... you've you're not only just into F1, you've taken up golf, is that right? You're taking part Oh, in my God. So this is, yeah. Listen, I have signed up for a challenge. Do you play golf? Uh, I'm, I had my Badly. first lesson before um, lockdown, so I won't be on a course anytime. If you need a show, uh, like a driver. Buggy, Little caddy. Yeah, yeah, great caddy. Well, actually, there's a bit of a story about that because I, I, the boys, all the boys on our team play golf and we went to play in Bahrain and they said, come on, Pinks, just get involved. I said, all right, all right, all right, I'll come. I can't play. I've never played, but I'll come. And I'm not bad off the tee because I used to play hockey, so I've got you know got a bit yeah. of power behind it. Short game, disgusting. No, not a clue. Um, so I said, "Well, I'll be the caddy." Well, I made it when it was sacrilege. I drove the buggy onto the green. Look at me whispering. <laughs> Why are you whispering? Oh my god! But yeah, you drove the buggy. And they went, "What are you doing?" And I said, "What?" I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I just went into pure panic. So you panic mode. and reverse into a bunker as well. Yeah, like, like, yeah. Like, ah, ah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then literally, security guards came out and said, "You have to leave this golf course." And I was like, "I didn't. I wasn't even concentrating." I was like, "But that's how bad I am." I Did mean, they like, try a few off? Golf Did they throw etiquette. You off? 
Did they what? Did the security throw you off in the end? Well, they managed to talk them down, Fine. but yeah, we weren't we weren't welcome back. Put it that way. Was that happy when you were to assume the role of naive woman? Then you weren't all power and liberated. You were like, oh, sorry, no, I don't really know how sorry. it works. Yeah. But you know, my poor late grandfather would have turned in his grave because he was a scratch golfer, passionate about the game, always wanted to educate me about it. And uh, yeah, I was mortified in that moment. But anyway, I am I am going to try and take it. There's a big drive to push up female numbers in the game, and. Um, I've agreed to take it on. But you, I, I believe you're taking part in some sort of competition against a couple of other presenters to try and win. Yes, something, isn't it? Yeah. I don't. I don't even know if this is public knowledge yet or not. But you know, well, it we'll, is now. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> quick scissors, edit yeah, this out if we out. need to. Yeah. No, um, it's uh, it's brilliant. It's a great initiative to again to to to, to push up uh, female participation. There's me and three other female presenters who've never played before. They all seem like great laugh, these girls. And we have to play each other in the summer. Whoever wins that then gets the chance to play in a celebrity pro-am, an actual competition. Oh, my God. I mean, there's, there's pressure, huh? Yeah, there's a lot of pressure. There's there. a lot of and pressure. Are you hammering lessons or waiting to get lessons? Well, I can't lessons? No, because I know, the golf courses aren't open oh yet. God. So I'm literally in the back garden. By the way, our garden's like a postage stamp. It's already got a full gym in it, thanks to Wiggy. But you've gone mad for the gym stuff. I've seen you in, like, oh. night training. What are you doing? Like I know, but the, the night time's the only time I have to train. I can only justify it once I've put the kids to bed. you were doing bed. burpees in the rain. I sound like a I stalker. know, that was lush, <laughs> though. That was, that was invigorating. I'd had quite a bad day. Um, and I never kind of admit to myself if I'm struggling with something, and I definitely was struggling about Flacky, and I just had this really low day, and I remember speaking to Julia Samuel, and she said, look, Nats, you love exercise, just get out there right now. I said, well, it's tonking it down, just do it. So I went out, and I did 100 burpees in the pouring rain. I felt incredible. I felt alive. There was just this rush of endorphins. It was just, and I know you and Chloe would, testify that's the best thing to do and I came in I had a clear mind I felt incredible so you've yeah. also felt like you've achieved something that's yeah. why exercise people think it's all about getting your body in shape it's not it's the putting your body through a bit of turmoil to feel you've achieved something yeah. it's so good for your mental health yeah. you know. and it did hurt 100 burpees yeah 100 hurt. burpees is vile we did 2,000 burpees with two other friends of Big ours. Big H, yeah. And, and Adam Bidders. Bidwell, yeah, Bidders for charity. Bidders no shoulder as well, hasn't he? Like, his shoulders fall out, so I don't <laughs> know why. It always a bit dodgy, wouldn't it, yeah, trying I, to do a burpee? Yeah, but I think that's why, he, I don't know why he chose to do burpees, because he's got bad shoulders or something, yeah, so. Yeah. But anyway, um, one thing I just want to ask you with, so so obviously you, you, you we talked in the podcast, is you're fighting for this kind of equality in F1. What do you think, if you're giving me your, th- your three things as a sport it needs to change that you would try to implement to get more women into it, what would you, what would you That's say? That's a really good question. So I've got the, um, there's an amazing lady within Formula One called Ellie Norman who's hugely passionate about gender diversity but also about bringing uh, more ethnic minorities in sport, more black faces in the paddock. Absolutely. Lewis Hamilton has set up the Hamilton Commission in order to do just that. Um, the problem with F1 is it's a very expensive sport. So automatically you rule out a lot of people. You know, you can pick up a football or a rugby. Rugby is obviously more technical, but football is universal for a reason. You can just kick a can about in the street. It, you know, anyone can play football. Mm. And actually some of the best players have come from very difficult backgrounds because they've just thrown everything into that. To do that in F1, you've got to have money because you've got to have a car. So what we need to address these socioeconomic issues as well. So there needs to be some sort of... And, you know, to recognise that you're any good at F1, you've got to try it carting out and to know that. But Lewis Hamilton is this incredible success story. This is a guy from a working class background. Again, as I've said, the only black racer in the history of the sport whose dad gave up everything, sacrificed everything in order to propel his son to success. And he could win his eighth world championship this year. I mean, that's astonishing. He's not just the best driver of all time. He's the best Best breast, British, <laughs> best British sports person of all time, and anyone that's got an issue with that, DM me because I, I, I never check them. I agree. <laughs> but, I think he... but no, the, the the point, you know, you cannot argue with the stats. On top of that, what he's doing with his platform is astonishing. So he somehow has got the energy and the passion, the drive to push forward the BLM agenda to talk about diversity, to talk about environmentalism, veganism, all these things that he's passionate about. So I take my hat off to him. So if we can't do something now, we can't ride this wave that Lewis Hamilton has created for us, we're never going to do it. So we have to do it 2021, 2022, before he leaves the sport because he has got us on the front and back pages. You know, this guy has got a, a voice and a global audience like none other. 
So we have to capitalize on that. And uh, we have to push and we have to make the sport more accessible for women. We've got to have more relatable role models on screen, which is why I've got to flag up the great work that women are doing up and down the paddock. And we've got to show women, you know, why is it that not enough girls go into STEM subjects at school? Why don't they? Because they go, oh, engineering is not really for me. But why not? You've got a brilliant brain, use it. And so we've got to offer them the opportunities to do that and then help accelerate them through the ranks once they're into the sport, like the Steph Travers of this world. That's what I would have thought, actually, of all the easy wins, because you're right, you know, the, the, the economic requirements to be a driver is, mm. is, is, you know, almost impossible for most people. But I think you're right, the engineering support staff would be, you know, kids kids are lost now. Kids go to university for the sake of going to university, get these degrees and mm. have no vocational application and don't know how to do it, you know. I think so many people should be turned on to engineering and, and, you know, aerodynamics and safety and all this other stuff. I think it'd be amazing. So I'll tell you one really quick story um, about uh, one of the uh, driver, well, sorry, one of the um, strategists at um, Red Bull, a girl called Hannah Schmitz. What happened at uh, Silverstone was that Max Verstappen had the slower car Definitely wasn't quicker than the Mercedes, but he won the race. And he won the race because he started on the whole hard compound of tyre, which at the time was quite a controversial decision. Like, why would you do that? Everyone else was starting on the softer compound. But it worked, and he ultimately won the race. And that decision was made by a woman. People didn't know that until afterwards. And in that moment, and I went to speak to her afterwards, and I said, how did you manage to convince some real alpha males within the team that that was the right decision? Because it was a controversial one. She said, actually, sometimes women just know how to feel their way with the art of persuasion. I'm sure Chloe can testify yes, to that. Yeah, yeah, But 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 she was able to use her skill set differently to men. And she was able to make... And, and in doing that, and in Max winning that race, he... He had a huge amount of respect for her and and then the trust grew. And now she and her role has since grown. So look, there are it's horses for courses in life and everything that we do, but there's so many potential roles for women within the sport. And um, you know, particularly black women um and people like Steph are, are showing that way and, and she she as I say gave this great talk. You can probably find it on YouTube, just about um the, the, the colour of your skin and your gender, your your sexual orientation, none of these things are a boundary, you know, and we need to just just keep talking. So things like this podcast are very useful. So the last thing I wanted to ask you about was the, your Access Sport. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? You're doing some oh, amazing charity yes. work, stuff around that. Yeah, so I, Access Sport is a charity I got involved with a very long time ago, but it's about using sport as a vehicle for change. And we're doing that also at Sky. Um, Sky Cares is an initiative within Sky that we're using volunteers within Sky to reach out to the local communities and make a difference. I mentioned Badu Sports uh, slightly earlier. Really, sport has this power, as you well know, and there's no judgment. Um, it's it's inclusive and 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 it makes a difference, and it's a way to communicate with young people. And I, 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 that is my big, big passion. The, the, the one passion project I really want to get off the ground. And we've been talking about it for ages at Sky, but COVID happened and it sort of put pay to a lot of our plans. But one thing I really want to do is, is go into communities, find out what they need, talk to them. Don't make it a vanity project, but actually speak to them about what they need to make a difference. You know that if you open a boxing gym in a certain part of town, the crime rate will go down youth unemployment will go down people will feel engaged they'll have a sense of purpose they'll have an outlet i interviewed anthony agogo to that extent he said exactly that that boxing was his savior so we know what sport can do so we just need to find different ways of engaging people in it that's that that is like my ultimate that's what i want to do but if we talk again in a year's time that's what i want to get but also you know i think we make a happier country more people are exercising more people playing sport definitely more people being part of a team, it will solve so many issues. Yeah. But we've got a government that think it's great just to promote being out on, on a smash and doing everything else. We want the high streets to work, but you know, yeah. I think it'd be a lot better. Um, Pink should be amazing. Oh. Um, if people want to hear your your podcast, where can they find it? What's it called? So we've got In the Pink, which you I, have been I a guest read, on. Do you know what? When I was doing the NAS, I knew it was that. I wanted you to say it. <laughs> I, I read it and I was like, how has she got away with calling it that? If you Google 
in the pink, it means to be in good health. Right. And a good place in your life. Okay. And that's, so and that's a story we're going with today. Be a dirtbag. No. All right. Well, I just read it. I was like, this You is have been a great guest on it. So anyone that wants to listen to your podcast, you were brilliant on it. So thank you for that. I'm also starting a new podcast called F1 Nation. It's not a new podcast, but I'm a new co-host on it. Um, and that's going to be starting from the beginning of the F1 season. So I'm really excited about doing that as well. Are you doing a lot of esports stuff now? Yeah, so through through both, through both all the lockdowns, um, esports, the growth has been exponential. Um, I think what a lot of people are realising, unlike other sports, actually the virtual game translates quite nicely. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of the grid playing the esports version of Formula One uh, in order to keep their skill set sharp to go back racing, because it is, you know, it's like being in a simulator, isn't it? Um, and I didn't realise just how addictive it is. So I've loved doing that, and it's a way of engaging with the younger audience as well, and saying, do you know what? This is wicked. And if you come and watch the real stuff as well, you'll get a buzz off it. And because we've got a bit of an ageing uh, sort of demographic watching linear television we need to be engaging with the younger audience as well so that's an important part of it and if people want to follow you on social media where can they find you these upcoming bikini shots <laughs> no, be flooded with gratuitous uh, half naked pics and stuff, yeah. no ooh. um just just at natalie i think it's just at natalie underscore pinkham on instagram natalie pinkham on so, so Twitter. Right, some natalie pinkham's gonna get a load of new followers <laughs> yeah well listen thanks so oh, much Hask, really, it's so really nice to talk to you it was amazing um that's been What a Flanker uh, with Natalie Pinkham. Obviously, if you like the podcast, please share, please subscribe. You can find this podcast on all of your regular platforms. It's also a YouTube show as well. We've got many more guests coming. I'll catch you all soon. Pinks, you're a legend. Thank you. Thank you.